Happy Nobel Laureate Day, St. Lucia. Celebrating excellence, inspiring our collective imagination, and fostering national pride. We are live from the Finance Administrative Center in Castries for the Sir Derek Walcott Memorial Lecture, the latest event of the 2023 Nobel Laureate Festival. My name is Jessie Léonce, as you've heard. This Nobel Laureate Festival event is being executed by the Cultural Development Foundation and sponsored by the Library Cooperative Credit Union. At this time, I would like to acknowledge the presence of a few persons, His Excellency Errol Charles, Acting Governor General of St. Lucia, former GG, Dame Perlette Luisi, Government Ministers present, uh, PSs and other public service officials, CDF Board of Directors, and I see the boss lady, E.D. Ramona Henry Wynn, good night to you, uh, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Ambassador Chen, Ambassador Life Escalona, Her Excellency Life Escalona, good night to you. Uh, we also want to make special mention of representatives from statutory organizations, specially invited guests, media partners, welcome to you all. In this latest installment of the Sir Derek Walcott Memorial Lecture, we will hear from a son of the soil, an award-winning poet, playwright, director, actor, cultural critic, the list goes on and on. But first, I want to welcome an author. We want to feature an author. And she published a text in 2022 and it's called Sweet Pain by Cheryl Rosemond. And uh, this excerpt that she will be reading um, is hoped to inspire you, ready you, give you a taste uh, before we get to the main course uh, for this evening. And her book uh, is, quote, an epic of intentional adventures that overpowered a life that was destined for suffering. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to welcome Miss Cheryl Rosemond to warm you up tonight. Good evening to everyone. I greet you all with a very warm embrace, Lucian style. And um, I only have very limited time, so I am going to just begin by saying that, you know, whatever, how, no, it doesn't matter how simple our life is, there's always something or so much that we can celebrate about our simple life right here in St. Lucia. And this is what this book is all about. So um, I'm going to just jump right into it and just share because it's about my life, my experience. I was an adopted child, and I know there are many young people, you know, moping around about their domestic life, their social life, and all different aspects. They have a lot of pain because people are not, you know, caring and extending themselves. So I will just share a little bit. In those days, the simplest things in life brought joy and served as a form of entertainment. Full moon or new moon would be quickly noticed by the shiny vegetation around the houses. Often, adults and children would assemble at the junction just because it was a bright night. For the children, it was always fun, a joyous time, a nice excuse to run and play some more before going to bed. The sky was where we got our toys from on such nights. First, the bright, shiny moon, which we believed moved along with us in whatever direction we went. This moving game, which included walking or running forward or backward 
with heads upwards and eyes fixed on the moon, saw many falling and bumping into each other. Then there was counting of the stars in the sky. The sky would be beautifully decorated with countless bright stars. No one could get the same figure when counting the clusters of stars. The third game always captured the interest of the adults, finding the best description for the shapes of the clouds. These outings took place any night of the week and were very refreshing and relaxing. After school, it was a common practice for a few of us little girls in the neighborhood to go visit a cute old lady, affectionately known as Majiji. These visits were always fun. She lived in a pink wooden house. I don't ever recall that house being painted in another color. It was well maintained by her family. Inside was decorated with flowers, ornaments, and lots of photos of her children and grandchildren. And of course, her attractive self. She was very attractive in her younger days. On every visit, she would gather us close to her. The visits always started with pictures. Every day, we would be reminded, see with your hands and touch with your eyes. She, would sa she sat at a roadside window at her dining table on afternoons. She would ask us about school and would encourage us to do well because education is important. Her English vocab was very limited. It always left us in giggles and smiles as she would say such things as, learn your ABCs, learn them well, so that when you grow up, you will be a gentle lady and would recite the alphabet forward and backward and ask us to say it like her. This we were subjected to on every single visit. We always had to tell Majiji who or whose we were. She could never remember. On the days we wanted to keep our visit short so we could go out on the road to play, we would play tricks on her. One of us would go outside or never come in, and while she was telling a story, another would be called with an altered voice. Whoever is called must answer with a shout, Yes, Mama, I come in! And this is how we began to excuse ourselves. As the one who runs out returns to say to another at close range that her mother asked her to come right now. By this, we thought ourselves... <laughs> We were so clever and giggled about it. Majiji moved on from this life whilst we were still very young. So it seemed very simple, but it was a fun experience. There are many children who never had little days like that. Many children are being raped. Many children are being sexually abused. Many children are being abandoned whilst a few of us get to have those little moments. And this book captures a lot of those um, little moments that I had when I was growing up along with others who were as fortunate as I was. And so I want to encourage you to uh, participate in the sale of the book. Uh, the book can be found on Amazon. But more than that, uh, it's not about money for me, but it's about stirring people to just reflect on their lives, be excited about what they experience in life. Um, was able to bring to them. Thank you so much. Wonderful. I'm glad that with elation she was able to see herself, greet herself, or arriving at her own door in her own mirror, smiling at her welcome. Part of the feast is essentially laying bare our lives and sharing to inspire others. So thank you very much, Ms. Cheryl Rosemond. And I said Cheryl Rosemond, but we can see, if we could go back to the screen, that on the book cover, it says Sherry, Sherry Bruno. So when you go onto Amazon to add the text to your cart later this evening, you can um, just... Type in the search engine, Sherry Bruno, and you will get it. Thank you very much once again. 
what the twilight keeps saying following the gaze of Derek Walcott. We will be hearing from guest speaker Dr. Travis Weeks this evening. And uh, I invite you now to take a look at this featured video uh, providing a very special introduction. You know, we're in the new age. I don't have to do these things anymore. A very special introduction of Dr. Weeks, his accomplishments and his impact. Take a look. Dr. Travis Weeks is an award-winning St. Lucian poet, playwright, and director. He is also an actor and cultural critic. He studied literature at the University of West Indies Mona and theater at the Jamaica School of Drama and Cultural Studies at the Cable Campus of UWI. As a researcher and a dramatist, Dr. Weeks focuses on the indigenous traditions and discourse in the theater of Nobel Prize winning playwright Derek Walcott. He also uses this research to develop innovative dramaturgical approaches to his own theater practice, both as a playwright and a director. Indeed, he has written several plays and scripted the production Jazz Country, which was staged as part of St. Lucia's presentation to Carifesta 2013 in Suriname. His play, The Field of Power, was staged to mark the celebrations of Nobel Laureate Week in St. Lucia 2015. Another of his plays, The Fight for Bellevue, has been translated into French Creole, which he has also directed for a stage reading in Martinique. Dr. Weeks has worked as the Cultural Education Officer of the Folk Research Center in St. Lucia, lecturer in French Lexicon Creole at Cable UWI, and lecturer in Caribbean Studies and Theatre Arts at the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College in St. Lucia. He has also lectured extensively on St. Lucian and Caribbean culture, both in and out of the region. He is currently employed as the theater coordinator and lecturer in theater at the Department of Creative and Festival Arts of the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. Last year, he directed a film adaptation of his play, The Fight for Belle V, with his student actors. In 2022, he staged his most recent play, Mene Mwe Monripo, with the children of Helen Alliance at the Wellington Library in Florida, USA. This year, 2024, Dr. Weeks has directed a play entitled Sunday with the Warlord by Dawad Phillips, based on the life of the Calypsonian Lord Blakey. This play will be staged at the Naparima Bowl, San Fernando, Trinidad, on February 4th. Dr. Weeks is also in the process of directing Derek Walcott's The Joker of Seville, scheduled to open at the Central Bank Auditorium on April 19th in Port of Spain, Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Week's publication include two plays, The Fight for Belle V and The Field of Power. Bodies, memories and spirits discuss on selected cultural forms and practices in St. Lucia and a collection of poems entitled Let There Be Jazz. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Travis Weeks. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So many of my elders here, so many of my teachers. I really should just sit down and try to learn some more. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really good to see so many friends, well-wishers, and teachers in particular. I learned so much. Over so many years, I'm getting old, and I hope this is knowledge you're seeing that white there. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, let's dive into it. What the Twilight Keeps Saying, Following the Gaze of Derek Walcott. The essay, What the Twilight Says, prefaces Walcott's first collection of plays, Dream on Monkey Mountain and other plays. In the essay, Walcott, it appears, reflects upon his work as an artist in the Caribbean and speak to his engagement with the politics of culture and blackness in Caribbean society. He had co-founded the St. Lucia Arts Guild in 1950. One of the first plays performed by the Guild was Henri Christophe, based on the Haitian Revolution. In 1958, he wrote and directed Drums and Colors for the opening session of the West Indies Federation, and in 1959, he co-founded the Trinidad Theatre Workshop. 
The play Dream on Monkey Mountain, which chronicles a black man's journey to self-realization, was first performed in Canada in 1967. Intense protests began among black students in 1968 at a conference held at George Williams University in Canada. What the Twilight Says was published in 1970, quite a significant year, as it was the year of the Black Power Revolution in Trinidad and Tobago. The point of this timeline here is that Walcott was at the cusp of the rise in cultural and political consciousness among Caribbean blacks that took place in the 1960s. For this reason, the essay What the Twilight Says provides extremely useful insight into the poet's outlook on the cultural politics of the period. And even more importantly, it may throw light on our dark fumbling with some of the serious social issues currently affecting Caribbean communities. The essay is a political missive though, and thus before we actually get to it, I would like you to join me as I follow the gaze of Walcott, the poet and painter, and his symbolism of the twilight. Walcott begins his lengthy autobiographical poem, Another Life, by capturing the twilight on the Vigi Peninsula, a historical landmark just off the city of Castries, St. Lucia. He uses the twilight not only to highlight the decline of the British Empire, but also to project at once a vision for decolonization. Twilight, that time of day when the sun appears to descend and conversely the moon begins its ascent, captured the poet's imagination as a transience that can signify the attainment of our goal and gold. As the sun, tired of empire, declines, it throws a golden light in the sky and on the land, presenting a golden opportunity for colonized blacks to see themselves in a new light. The poet painter embraces that cause. The Vigi Peninsula has been a strategic location for the British in protecting their interests during the rival colonial wars for the Caribbean. The landscape here is covered by old soldiers' barracks. Walcott picks up picks out particular images captured in Twilight at Viji, as recalls a very significant part of the history of the island when it was a major coaling station. The peninsula outlines one part of the harbor where in the late 19th and earlier part of the 20th centuries, ships from all over came to dock for replenishments of coal. The coaling industry was run by the British and the beast of burden were black women who walked up planks carrying baskets of coal on their heads to offload into the waiting ships. This was no doubt strenuous and degrading work. But as we follow the Walcott gaze, we see that that twilight captures not degradation, but instead selects the strength and beauty of those black female coal carriers. Walcott also uses images of the seascape to symbolize the artist's responsibility in the psychical decolonization process. As the young poet gazes over the harbor, his mission and the trajectory of his work would be to accomplish a counter-colonial discourse until this ocean's a shut book, and like a bulb, the white moon's filaments wane. The imagery is strong. White moon's filaments wane with European colonization. As the white empire of the British declines, the time came for a new book, a story of the strength and beauty of the island and its people, caught now in gilded frame by the twilight. It is important to place the young poet's vision into some historical context in order to fully appreciate the strength and power of his ambition, not only for himself, but also for his people. Walcott was born in the year 1930, on the brink of the Second World War, and smack in the middle of the Great Depression in the USA. The 1930s also marked intense labor upheavals in the Caribbean, caused in part by the spread of Garveyism. Marcus Garvey was back in Jamaica, having been deported from the USA, and was establishing UNIA centers throughout the Caribbean, St. Lucia included. Caribbean blacks were demanding better wages, better working conditions, and the right to participate more fully in the governance of their territories. Subsequently, the Mayan Commission, a 
a project launched by the British to investigate the social and economic conditions in the Caribbean, confirmed the horrible living and working conditions of the large number of working class people in the region. By the time World War II ended in 1945, Walcott would have been 15, nearing the end of his secondary education at St. Mary's College. Also, by this time, Sir Arthur Lewis, who was 15 years older, would have been an assistant master at the London School of Economics, the first black man to be part of the faculty. He was a developmental economist, and the focus of his research was on how to best utilize the labor in the West Indies for the economic development of the region. King Sugar had been on the decline for some time, and in St. Lucia, the estates were being abandoned, and hundreds of people had flocked to the city of Castries in search of work. The coaling industry in Castries spanned the period of the late 19th century and the earlier part of the 20th century. The coaling industry was a British investment run by Peter and Company Limited. There was work on the wharf. The boy Walcott would be spending time with his mentor, Harry Simmons, at his studio on Barnard Hill. Harry would have, been ex would have exposed him to the best painters of the European Renaissance period and beyond. In his sojourns around that part of Castries, Walcott would have witnessed the women coal carriers carrying baskets of coal up the plank to be deposited onto, into the ships. He would have witnessed the masquerade performers from many of the stevedores who had come to settle in communities around the city to work. He would have witnessed the wharf rats, as they were called, diving competitively competitively, sorry, for coins into the water at Cornwy. The blackened coal carriers and the masqueraders would be significant drivers of inspiration. European colonization had created a society that was rigidly stratified along lines of race, color, and class. Whites from the French and British ancestry, along with the expatriates of European origin, occupied the top of the social scale followed in descending order by mulattoes, browns, and then blacks, the formerly enslaved at the bottom. Walcott's parents were educated mulattoes, and he therefore fell one rung below, below sorry, the apex of the social structure. He has written that both his grandfathers were white and both his grandmothers were black. Yet despite his birth into that upper strata of society, factors such as the involvement of his family in the arts and the influence of his mentor, Harry Simmons, brought Walcott into constant engagement with the cultural practices of the ordinary folk. Consequently, he was pulled by a commitment to what seems like two separate cultural species, one black and the other white. The writer drew from the cultural material of both species and attempts a reconciliation of the racial division within and without. Though his long career as a writer, dedicated to a resolution of his own internal racial conflict, Walker would provide a mirror to the deep, lingering wound affecting the formerly enslaved. He has been brutally honest in showing that the consequence of colonization among the formerly colonized was the deeply ingrained, ingrained hatred for their own color. In another life, Walker would offer a poetic discourse to imagine the ordinary black St. Lucian emerging from that debilitating colonial experience described above into a golden light that prizes him or her into a figure of strength and beauty. In Omeros, 20 years later, he would continue to imagine a healing of the wound of self-hatred necessary for the self-actualization of Caribbean blacks. I will follow Walcott's gaze in between the publication of these two texts to illustrate the consistency in what the twilight says, what the twilight keeps saying. As he begins another life, the poet's depiction of the startling twilight provided the symbolism for his mission of psychological decolonization. And I'm quoting from another life. Begin with twilight when a glare which held a cry of buggles lowered the coconut lances of the inlet as a sun tired of empire, declined. It mesmerized like fire without wind, and as its amber climbed, the bare-stained ovals of the British fort above the promontory, the sky grew drunk with light. Twilight here seems a celebration of the poet's coming of age. The sky grew drunk with light. 
he and his fellow painter danced on St. Toma, were drunk with light as they celebrated, as they heralded this defining moment of decolonization. It was their time. There was your heaven, the clear glaze of another life, a landscape locked in amber, the rare gleam. The dream of reason had produced its monster, a prodigy of the wrong age and color. What was the heaven? The ethereal beauty in that moment of transience between the light and the dark that would hold the painter's gaze. The realization that the most profound satisfaction would come from an elevation of his island and people to that golden height. The Dream of Reason was the title of one from a series of paintings by Spanish painter Francisco Goya. However, whereas Goya was critical of the widespread political and religious abuses of the time period, in this particular painting, he depicts himself falling asleep and then experiencing nightmares of devils. Walcott's reference to Goya's dream of reason perhaps betrays an awareness of the horrendous but enticing responsibility that he was beginning to embrace. He was going through his own period of enlightenment, but his imagination was boundless. He presents himself here as a prodigy of the wrong age and color. The fact that the poet, the young poet, saw himself as being of the wrong age and color is significant because it speaks to his identity how he saw himself. He was of the wrong age. He and his pairs were starting their own renaissance, not in the Middle Ages, but in the 20th century. Not in Europe, but in a small British colony in the Caribbean. He was of the wrong color. Mark his identity, if I may echo a line from Bob Marley. He identified himself not with those of light skin privilege, but with the ordinary black folk on the island. Thus, from very early, the poet embraced a mission of decolonization. His gaze became transfixed upon the transience of twilight as signifying the turn of an epoch. In this twilight, he envisioned the elevation of his people. As a young painter in the studio of Harry Simmons, studying a method to paint the landscape, his gaze fell on the light, and he waited for the tidal amber glare to glaze the last shacks of the morn till they became a cinquento fragrant, sorry, a cinquento fragment in guilt frame. He wanted his landscape and his people in guilt frame, G-I-L-T, gilded. Thus, the process of studying the light on the landscape to gain accuracy resulted in a clarity of poetic vision. It is such a vision that sustained his motivation. This restoration was necessary to counter the feelings of inadequacy wrought by white supremacy. The cry seems profound and spontaneous. And he wrote, Oh, mirror! Where a generation yearned for whiteness, for condor unreturned. Where a generation yearned for whiteness, for condor unreturned. Colonization dealt a serious wound. Not only were we made to hate our race, color, and culture, but we longed to become like our very enslavers. I do not know to what extent generations can understand that wound, current generations, that is, can understand that wound, that yearning for whiteness. Although I came of age, fortunately, after the work of Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, etc., and during the expansion of Rastafari, I saw people around me from whom I received the impression that they yearned for whiteness. This was that generation born in the earlier part of the 1900s before the decolonization and independence movement had taken root. Walcott's recognition of self-hatred as the most debilitating condition of colonization was expressed quite earnestly by other Caribbean intellectuals before him, among which are Marcus Garvey and Franz Fanon. As a preacher, 
Gavi advocated for black theology that reinterpreted the Bible, representing important prophets and saints as black. His theology suggested that if we were made in the image and likeness of God, then it was not necessary for us to worship white representations, as God should be black. Gavi, of course, recognized the psychological wound done by the imposition of white religious symbols upon the colonized. Fanon speaks clearly to the sense of inferiority fed, felt sorry, by the black man as a result of the colonial experience as manifested in actions suggesting a yearning for whiteness. It is against this background that we study the Walker Gaze. The young poet zoom on the landscape and the seascape around the Castries Harbor at twilight would crystallize his vision for encapsulating the wholeness of his people. That time of day dusk stimulated a mode of inspiration for the poet and painter in one. This sense of wholeness, however, could only be achieved by a full acceptance and restoration of that degraded part of his ancestry, the lineage of his grandmothers, his African roots. This personal agenda fired the development of a conscious and deliberate discursive trajectory of artistic restoration of pride in the indigenous as represented in the mean by blackness. As one follows the Walcott Gaze, one sees with him the struggles of Caribbean blacks, but one sees as well the focus of his lens on the grace, strength of the folk, the fisherman, the peasant, in an early poem, The Harbor, Walcott captures fishermen in the twilight rowing homeward. In this poem, it is clear that the stature and movement of the fishermen rowing home provide a source of inspiration for the poet. He compares his own journey as an artist to that of the fishermen braving perilous waters. Here, what, here is what he writes. The fishermen rowing homeward in the dusk do not consider the stillness through which they move. So I, since feelings drown, should no more ask for the safe twilight which your calm hands gave. The fishermen seem unconscious, though, of the grace of their moving arms as they work their way home. It is the poet's gaze that captures that grace in the dusk, because the scene, the scene mirrors his own aspirations. As an emerging artist then, he hopes that the gaze upon him would see in him as well a similarity of movement. He writes, Yet others who watch my progress outward on a sea which is crueler than any word of love may see in me the calm my passage makes, braving new water. The poet's admiration for the bravery and courage in fishermen would find expression again in the character of Afa. In the Sea of Dauphin, we follow his gaze to meet the fishermen, Afa, Garcia, and Agustin. Afa is the hard-hearted rebel who blasphemes, revolts against the church, and curses the priest, according them some responsibility for the poverty of the people. Afa explains the reason for his bravery. Afa says, this brave I have, it comes from many years, many years of sea, many years of dolor that crack my face and make my heart so hard. The poet's early identification with the strongest of those fishermen also revealed another aspect of how he shaped his character, how he embraced a particular stoicism that would drive an independent mindset. How you develop an unflinching commitment to his own perfection as an artist and to demanding the same of those who worked with him. His gaze upon Afa becomes his reflection. This characterization and identification with the power of a fisherman provide an indication of the identity of the poet. He saw himself in the fishermen. He took their bravery, so to speak, their courage, to venture out into the perilous ocean every morning. This can be likened to the project that he would set himself, waking up early in the morning to prepare, shape his craft, to navigate his journey into the vast world of literature with utmost strength and confidence. Walcott's craft 
did take him out into the vast world outside of the Caribbean. The collection of poems, the Arkansas Testament, is Walker's first publication after several years of living and working at Boston University in the United States. Quite likely, in that setting, he must have become even more fully aware of his own racial and cultural identity. Following the poet's gaze in one of the poems in this collection entitled The Light of the World, we see several individuals journeying on a bus from Castries to Grosely. The time of day is dusk, and Walcott's persona is waiting for the bus to be filled, as Mali was rocking on the transport stereo. The Light of the World. Mali was rocking on the transport stereo and the beauty was humming the choruses quietly. I could see where the lights on the planes of her cheek streaked and defined them. If this were a portrait, you'd leave the highlights for last. These lights silkened her black skin. I'd have put in an earring, something simple in good gold for contrast, but she wore no jewelry. I imagined the powerful and sweet odor coming from her as from a still panther. And the hair, there was nothing else but heraldic. When she looked at me, then away from me politely, because any staring at strangers is impolite, it was like a statue, like a black Delacroix, liberty leading the people. The gently bulging whites of her eyes, the carved ebony mouth, the heft of the torso, solid and a woman's but gradually even that was going in the dusk except the line of her profile and the highly cheek and i thought oh beauty you are the light of the world it was not the only time i would think of that phrase in the 16-seater transport that hummed between grosily and the market with his grit of charcoal and the litter of vegetables after Saturday's sales and the roaring rum shops outside whose bright doors you saw drunk women on pavements, the saddest of all things, winding up their week, winding down their week. The market, as it closed on this Saturday night, remembered the childhood of wandering gas lanterns, hung on poles at street corners, and the old roar of vendors and traffic when the lamplighter climbed, hooked the lantern on its pole, and moved on to another. And the children turned their faces to its moth, their eyes white as their nighties. The market itself was closed in its involved darkness, and the shadows quarreled for bread in the shops, or quarreled for the formal custom of quarreling in the electric rum shops. I remember the shadows. The van was slowly filling in the darkening depot, I sat in the front seat. I had no need for time. I looked at two girls, one in a yellow bodice and yellow shorts with a flower in her hair and lusted in peace. The other, less interesting. That evening, I had walked the streets of the town where I was born and grew up, thinking of my mother with her white hair tinted by the dying dusk and the tilting box houses that seemed perverse in their cramp. I had peered into parlors with half-closed jalousies at the dim furniture, Morris chairs, a center table with wax flowers, and the lithograph of Christ of the Sacred Heart, vendors still selling to the empty streets, sweets, nuts, sodden chocolates, nut cakes, mints. An old woman with a straw hat over her headkerchief hobbled towards us with a basket. Somewhere, some distance off was a heavier basket that she couldn't carry. She was in a panic. She said to the driver, Pa kite moi a te! Which is in her history and that of her people. Don't leave me on earth. Or by a shift of stress, don't leave me the earth for an inheritance. Pa kite moi a te, heavenly transport. Don't leave me on earth. I've had enough of it. The bus filled in the dark with heavy shadows that would not be left on earth. No, that would be left on the earth and would have to make out. Abandonment was something they had grown used to, and I had abandoned them. I knew they were sitting in the transport in the sea quiet dusk with men hunched in canoes and the orange lights from the Viji headland, black boats on the water. I, who could never solidify my shadow to be one of their shadows, had left them their earth. 
the white rum quarrels and the coal bags, the hatred of corporals, of all authority. I was deeply in love with the woman by the window. I wanted to be going home with her this evening. I wanted her to have the key to our small house by the beach at Groselet. I wanted her to change into a smooth white nighty that would pour like water over the black rocks of the breasts, to lie simply beside her by the ring of a brass, brass lamp with a kerosene wick and tell her in silence that her hair was like a hill forest at night, that a trickle of rivers was in her armpits, that I would buy her Benin if she wanted to and never leave her on earth, but the others too. Because I felt a great love that could bring me to tears and a pity that prickled my eyes like a nettle, I was afraid I might suddenly start sobbing on the public transport with the Mali going and a small boy peering over the shoulders of the driver and me at the lights coming. Yeah, at the rush of the road in the country darkness with lumps in the houses on the small hills and thickets of stars. I had abandoned them. I had left them on earth. I had left them to sing Mali songs of sadness as real as the smell of rain on dry earth or the smell of damp sand. And this bus felt warm with the neighborliness, the consideration, and the polite partings. In the light of its headlamps, in the blare, in the third sobbing music, the claiming scent that came from their bodies, I wanted the transport to continue forever. For no one to descend and say a good night in the beams of the lamps and take the crooked path up to the lit door guided by fireflies. I wanted a beauty to come into the warmth of considerate wood to the relieve the rattling of enamel plates in the kitchen and the tree in the yard. But I came to my stop outside the Halcyon Hotel. The launch would be full of transients like myself. Then I would walk with the surf of the beach. I got off the van without saying good night. Good night would be full of inexpressible love. They went on in the transport. They left me on earth. Then a few yards ahead, the van stopped. A man shouted my name from the transport window. I walked up towards him. He yelled out something. A pack of cigarettes had dropped from my pocket. He gave it to me. I turned, hiding my tears. There was nothing they wanted. Nothing I could give them. But this thing that I have called the light of the world. Once again, we observe a pattern. First, the poet captures the struggles of the ordinary black folk, but then the images became, becomes, become quickly transformed by the twilight into perceptions of strength, beauty, and power. Here, as the persona sits on the bus, he also notices that an old woman with a straw hat over a headkerchief was hobbling towards the bus with a basket. The woman was in a panic. She said to the driver, Paki te te. The fact that Walker chooses to highlight this old woman is significant. The description of her brings stark familiarity. She is the poor black grandmother of our island. The fact that she's old suggests our seemingly unending struggle. The poet writes that somewhere, some distance off, was a heavier basket that she couldn't carry. He never really identifies what this heavier basket is. Perhaps the old woman decided to take up the lighter basket to run and catch the bus, leaving the heavier one behind that she'll fetch once she has been able to stop the driver. The interpretation works at that literal level. However, the heavier basket that she couldn't carry could also represent the burden of history, of colonization, the legacy of degradation, but also the responsibility to alleviate the effects of that poverty and on the development. On the bus, the gaze turns to one of two women and the vision of upliftment begins. The poet casts the twilight on the planes of her cheeks and the persona imagines that this light silkened and defined them. Superficially, the effect of the twilight is to merely offer a heightened appreciation for the beauty of the black woman. The masculinity of the persona poet kicks in and he leads the reader into quite a sensuous engagement, imagining a powerful and sweet odor coming from her. As the bus travels from Castries to Groselet, the traveler pours the lights from the environment as well as from his imagination into the verse. The images of light are clear when he writes that he wanted her to change into a smooth white nighty that would pour like water over the black rocks of her breasts. The contrast between the black and white here illuminates 
and the scene becomes romanticized with a glue as the traveler imagined lying next to the woman by the ring of a brass lamp with a kerosene wick. There are cues in the image, however, that reflect a consistency in what the twilight says. The poet aims at a restoration of pride in color and ancestry. He appreciates the bulging whites of her eyes, the carved ebony mouth. The head he recognizes was nothing else but heraldic. The choice of the word heraldic here reinforces the notion that the woman descends from a powerful lineage. His reference to Benin, an ancient kingdom of Africa, and his offer to buy her that kingdom if she wanted it, suggests a yearning for an imagined royalty in the African motherland. Even when it became almost too dark to see in that moment of transience, when everything was going in the dusk, the persona poet caught the line of the, her profile and the highly cheek and comes to this conclusion in the twilight, O oh beauty, you are the light of the world. Walcott continues to use the interplay of the light of the sun and the moon at twilight to suggest trajectories of renewal. We witness the same in the play Dream on Monkey Mountain. He sets the beginning of the action thus. A spotlight warms the white disc of an African drum until it glows like the round moon above it. Below the moon is the stark silhouette of a volcanic mountain. Reversed, the moon becomes the sun. A volcanic mountain. As day changes into night, so the transition from crown colony to independence will be no different if Caribbean blacks do not heal themselves from the shame of their blackness. Without such healing, there will be no new civilization here. Twilight captures the possibility of accepting and appreciating the value of both worlds, of raising the African ancestry to full and equal value and acceptance. Following the Walcott gaze and understanding what the twilight says, what the twilight keeps saying, one studies his reflections in the poem Lavantil. The poem takes its title from that settlement on a hill in the city of Port of Spain, Trinidad. It is a community occupied mainly by descendants of black working class migrant workers. Walcott gazes upon the hill in the twilight. And he wrote, I stand out on a balcony and watch the sun pave its flat golden path across the roofs, the aerials, cranes, the tops of fruit trees, crawling downward to the city. Something inside is laid open like a wound. Some open passage that has cleft the brain, some deep amnesiac blow. We left somewhere a life we never found. The sun's golden path would illuminate the overcrowded living conditions of Lavantil, a community on a hill above the city of Port of Spain, settled by the descendants of enslaved Africans. It is a community where the inheritors of the Middle Passage stewed five to a room, still clumped below their hatch, breeding like felonies. The poet's concern is the children from habitual wombs and the lives fixed in the unalterable groove of grinding poverty. Lavantil is, to some extent, a dark place on the psyche of the state of Trinidad, a community noto notorious for crime. Walcott likens this darkness to the same experience below the deck on the slave ship during the Middle Passage. The residents of Lavantil were still trapped. He writes, the Middle Passage never guessed its end. This is the height of poverty for the desperate and black. The light that the poet carried to his ruminations upon Lavantil allows him to identify with the residents and focus his lens upon the reasons for their predicament. And he writes, some grail of light clung shut on us in bondage and withheld us from that world below us and beyond. And in its swaddling cerements, we're still bound. Ladies and gentlemen, we followed Walcott's gaze in another life, his first book-length poem, and witnessed his lens envisioning gold for even the poor black inhabitants of his island. Good gold. I'd like you to follow his gaze now in Omerus, undoubtedly his most impacting book-length poem, which he wrote over 20 years later. 
Walker would turn his gaze again to that sight in Castries, that sight of the wharf rats, the stevedore masqueraders, that sight of the phenomenal grace and endurance of the coal carriers. And he writes, in his boyhood, he had seen women climb like ants up a white flower pot, baskets of coal balanced on their torsion heads without touching them, up the black pyramids, each spine straight as a pole, and with a strength that never altered its rhythm. Look, they climb, and no one knows them. They take their copper pittances and your duty from the time you watch them from your grandmother's house. As a child wounded by their power and beauty is the chance you now have to give those feet a voice. The gaze is one of pure admiration for those black women, for their skill and strength, and for their poise. These are the qualities that Walcott saw when, as a boy, he witnessed those coal carriers. The skill of balancing the baskets without touching them, the strength in their backbone, and the consistency in their measure, a suggestion of grace. As he reflects upon them further, we realize that those black coal carriers were actually an inspiration to the young poet. They were his black grandmothers. The last line in this stanza is of utmost significance to the cause and success of the poet. The rhythm of the cold, dusted, naked feet of the coal carriers as they climb the plank becomes a new take, a West Indian version, if you like, of the Alexand Alexandrian meter, the superficial choice of meter for the poem. Giving the feet of the coal carriers a voice is a part of the upward journey to decolonization. It is psychic healing. The honest confrontation of history for psychological healing necessitates an adjustment of gaze. This is what the twilight keeps saying, and therefore, as the poet turns our gaze to our coal-carrying maternal ancestors, he calls us to heal. See her there, my mother, my grandmother, my great-grandmother. See the black ants of their sons, the coal-carrying mothers. Feel the shame, the hate draining from all our bodies. The colonial legacy left us a wound. The metaphor is that saw carried by Philip Tet, another character in Omeros, who saw on his leg won't heal. Walcott writes, he believed the swelling came from the chain ankles of his grandfathers, or else why was there no cure? That the cross he carried was not only the ankles, but that of his race, for a village black and poor, and the pigs that rooted in its burning garbage then we're hooked on the anchors of the abattoir. Our minds need to be decolonized if we are to heal from our wound of self-hatred. It is this self-hatred that is retarding our development and by extension the development of our societies. Mark Hillman prepares a root bath in a cauldron to wash off Philoctet's wound. It is a traditional herbal remedy that you would have inherited from our African ancestors. It is significant that it was a root bath it is also significant that she had him bathed in a cauldron. It is one of those cauldrons from the old sugar mill. They connect to plantation slavery and to the reason for Philoctet's shame. The healing process requires a confrontation of our colonial history, not a refusal to engage it. Walcott confronts the ghost of his own colonial family heritage that obstructed his own healing. Both of his parents were mulattoes and are responsible for his early preoccupation with European art. His father, who had died when he was only one, he had left books behind that secured a link to the culture of Europe. Walker describes separate imagined encounters with both of his parents. One of his mother at the Marian home in St. Lucia when he visits from the US, and the other with his father, who suddenly appears to him in Boston. In confronting his parents, he makes it a point that he has now come into his own. To his father, he says, you could have been my child, and the more I live, the more our ages widen. During his visit to his mother, he surmises, I was both father and son. He wishes to make a point here, perhaps, that he had outgrown them. It appears he had come to the realization that he must emerge from the seemingly complete whiteness of their legacy in order to fully accept his African roots, a crucial part of the healing process. He describes the end of his visit with his mother thus, I left her on the veranda 
with her white hair. The symbolism is clear. The color of her hair represents the white component of his heritage. He left that component of his heritage to buckets clanging in the African twilight where two girls at the standpipe collected water. Similarly, he describes his sudden imaginary encounter with his father when he's strolling along a beach in Marblehead, a town in Massachusetts. And he writes, white shoes were blocking my path. I looked up. My father stood in the white drill suit of his, of his eternal summer on another wharf. This is quite a fitting place for an imaginary encounter with his father. Another wharf, not the wharf of the coal carriers, but a wharf in a big city. The choice of Marblehead there signifies Walcott's association of his father with the stone sculptures, the literatures, and paintings of Western cities. The father confesses that he saw his shadow on the flagstones of big cities, that the histories carried him over the bridge of self-contempt. Therefore, this description of the imagined encounter of his parents when the poet was 60 years old speaks to his own conscious personal efforts at psychical decolonization. To conclude, I would like to draw attention to the essay from which the title of this presentation got its name, which Walcott first published in 1970. I had to convince you of the poet's commitment to black consciousness before I got to the actual essay, because the essay is really a political missive that through Walcott I sensed into some serious controversy. I think, though, that at this juncture in our history, we need to revisit some of the points that Walcott was making and consider whether he envisioned some of the problems that we are now experiencing in too many of our communities. Here are some direct quotations from the essay. Every state sees its image in those forms which have the mass appeal of the sport, seasonal and amateurish. Stamped on that image is the old colonial grimace of the laughing nigger, steel bandsman, carnival masker, calypsonian and limbo dancer. These popular artists are trapped in the state's concept of the folk form, for they preserve the colonial demeanor and threaten nothing. This was not what a generation envisaged 20 years ago, when a handful of childish visionaries foresaw a republic devoted to the industry of art, for in those days, we had nothing else. How does the state see our arts? And what do we do about it? A second quotation. We recognize illiteracy for what it was, a defect, not the attribute it is now considered to be by, revolution, by revolutionaries. Next quote. No, for the colonial artist, the enemy was not the people or the people's crude aesthetic, which he refined and orchestrated. The enemy was those who had elected themselves as protectors of the people, frauds who cried out against indignities done to the people, frauds yeah, who urged them to acquire pride, which meant abandoning the individual dignity, who cried out that black is beautiful, like transmitters from a different revolution, without explaining what they meant by beauty. All of these had emerged from nowhere suddenly. Their rough philosophies were meant to coarsen every grace, to demean courtesy, to brook no debate. We had come from an older, wiser, sadder world that had already exorcised those devils. But these were calling out the old devils to political use. Which doctors of the new left, the new left, with imported totems. The people were ready to be betrayed again. I am reminded of Papa Doc and Baby Doc and the legacy and chaos in Haiti. Walcott had some big quarrels, quarrels like the sound of buckets clashing near the standpipe in the twilight. It seems to me that his quarrel with some academics and intellectuals in the Caribbean society stemmed from what he sensed was a danger of cultivating an identity politics primarily for self-posturing and for the acquisition of power. But Walcott's quarrels with many of his contemporaries also stemmed from his conviction that the Caribbean was home and that the Caribbean person should readily embrace the entirety of his cultural heritage and out of this fashion a new identity. The Nobel Committee recognized this when they noted his poetic oeuvre of great luminosity, the outcome of a multicultural commitment. The Nobel Committee was right, of course. However, 
there is a bit of a complication. And this complication has been the whole point of my discussion here. The fact that Walcott was committed to multicultural harmony does not mean that he was not committed to the cause of black liberation. The fact that he drew from Western theater conventions does not mean that he was not committed to the use of African-derived theater practices. The fact that he was schooled and practiced in European poetic forms does not mean that he was not passion passionately engaged in the creative use of Caribbean orality. Given the heroic status that we give to Walcott through these annual celebrations, these misconceptions about his work need to be cleared. Thank you. Thanks. Um, any questions? It's fine. Um, I'll come in. Sir. One more time, give it up for Dr. Weeks. What the twilight keeps saying. I now want to invite uh, the audience present here tonight to the microphone on my left, on your right, and there's also another microphone here as well um, to ask questions, engage in discussion at this time. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Gregory Antoine Dan, an enthusiast of um, Nobel Laureates Week and so on, you know, and an enthusiast of poetry, of authoring and singing and so on, you know. And um, whatever it is, like, I wasn't around when Derek was in his full legacy, you know. I mean, he was sporadic. I was a little boy going to school primary and whatnot, eh? And um, I didn't know what really was going on. You know, so it seems that it's, it's like um, Bob Marley had that um, kind of feature, that kind of characterism of, um, not Bob Marley, but Derek Walker had that kind of characterism of Bob Marley's um, legacy. But um, <clears throat> then you find that um, he had poetry, his name was renounced with poetry and not liberation, which would have ex expanded our minds more about him and about the, 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 the facts of life in general, what he was actually initiating. I wonder why it wasn't that way. Thank you, Mr. Antoine. But you say he wasn't there in the middle of his legacy. I, I wasn't there as well. But um, I think that the fact that we have all these celebrations every year and all these talks um, will help us understand a little more about, you know, the liberation that you're thinking of, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Weeks, a very thought-provoking um, lecture. Um, Maya Motley has said that um, many of, of the region's problems is due to self-contempt, self-hatred, the notion that other people are inherently superior to us. Um, do you think some of, the issue, some of the problems she mentioned was the bleaching of our skins, um, the rising crime rate, and so forth? Do you think Walcott will agree? Well, I can't really speak for him, but considering um, the discussion and the admiration that you can see in his work for those women on the bus in the light of the world, um, definitely bleaching and all that would not be something <laughs> I think that um, he would admire considering what, what, he, what he wrote. But, yeah, I think I've heard Mia mention that. And, and I mean, I, I zeroed in on that because it's still very crucial because after, you know, Marcus Garvey's work, after the Black Power Revolution and, and struggles, after the advent of Rastafarianism, um, certainly a lot of work has been done. But given some of the crucial issues that we have now, we have to probe and see um, whether it's still 
uh, deeply rooted refusal for us to accept ourselves, our brother, and our sister as you know, and 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 their strength and power and intelligence, and our own uh, that we can use for our development. Whether it is that that deep underlying refusal for us to acknowledge our own equality in the world and, and start from there, whether that is the reason why we still have so much unsettling, to put it euphemistically, you know, issues in our community. Yeah. Expounding and propounding on um, Derek Walcott's writings and teachings so that we could reflect afresh on some of the works that he has um, left with us um, in our civilization so that we could make it a better place. But to, um, I want to um, reflect on some of the quotations that Derek has left us and how we could use it in our lives today, in the struggles of life, in the, the battle that we are in as a third world country and in our own personal struggles to help us reconcile and, and I will give some examples and I hope you could expand and propound on it. For example, in, he speak about breaking a vase. One of his quotations, break a vase and the love that it takes to reassemble the fragments is greater than the love that took the symmetry for granted when it was whole. In another place he speak of survival is the triumph of stubbornness. And in another place he says, um, uh, he says, um, could me, the, 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 um, how did he put it? He says, um, when we lose the tribal duty of helping one another, the kudame, we lose spirit and we lose the country as we have lost the, the flight of the pelican. These quotes are sort of tattooed in my memory and how it helps me personally navigate through the, some of the struggles of life. For example, breaking a vase. When we have conflicts, personal conflicts, or you know, among ourselves, among how do we resolve it, and the, the, the love that it takes to reassemble these fragments, the broken parts of our own society, and all of this kind of course. I'm just saying, you know, dig deeper in what Derek was trying to say, and can you just, you know, help us um, in, in, the, in, in some of these quotes that I've mentioned, and some of them that you know, how in the 21st century we could have apply that to solving our problems. People like what God is, other Nobel laureates, one of his quotes was, um, 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 in everything there is a crack, uh, but it's through the light that the crack gets in. And um, so he's, in essence, he's saying us, all of us have cracks. So we could be, you know, we, we need to be more sympathetic with one another in our weaknesses and in our strengths. So, you know, give us a little, you know, play with, play with it. Yeah. All right, well, yeah, I mean, your take on it is interesting because that um, vase imagery, um, you know, stemmed from his thoughts on, on the effects of colonization and the, disintegr the disintegration that it caused. But I, it's interesting how you apply it to what's happening now. And, and that is why I, towards the end of my discussion, I zeroed in on some of the issues that we're facing now. Because you see, when we talk about the wound, and he speaks a lot about the wound, um, and what is happening now in our communities, we really must ask ourselves, um, and, and yeah, the quotation I meant to mention about um, without telling him what beauty is, you know, um, do we have I'm speaking to you directly to your question. Do we have and do we cultivate our leaders, do they as well, a genuine love for the blacks in the communities, for the young black men in the communities? Or are they just pawns. When they are seen, how are they seen? Are they seen with loving eyes? What's the gaze? Or are they just seen as pawns? 
And if they are, does that speak to the wound and the self-contempt? And is all that related to what is happening in Caribbean society? The madness, to put it bluntly, that is happening in Caribbean society. You know, just like to go in one of the other little you were saying, um, uh, 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 um, in other words, we all have some kind of crap, we all have some kind of struggle, we all have some kind of a thing habiting us, troubling us. Well, I mean, that, that is, I, I, that is, um, that, that is life, I mean, yeah. you know, that is life, and I don't think that in itself is a problem, I mean, you know, when we're born, we just know it's life is a struggle. So the, the, the personal struggle, I think, is not, for me, the bigger problem. The bigger problems stem from some of the social issues, yeah? That is a bigger problem. Uh, you know, I mean, and it's not, it's, it's not peculiar to St. Lucia. It's, it's a Caribbean thing, and that is why... Um, when I reverted to the SC, what the Twilight says, where Walcott, I said, issued a political missive. You know, it's like Rodney and the issues Rodney had with his brothers. Um, you know, I mean, the brothers were up in arms at the time. It's like, hey, you, you know, this man, he had no black consciousness, you know. But now, years later, so many years later, and we see what is happening. You know, in Trinidad, in St. Lucia, in Jamaica, everywhere. We, we, we need to take stock again and kind of wheel and come again, to, so to speak. Wheel and come again and, and look at what we did, where we are, where we're going, what we're doing now. And seriously, um, look at our communities and, 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 and begin to see the young people as individuals, as people. See them as people, yeah? not as pawns. And I think that we, we, the citizens have to kind of cultivate that consciousness, yeah? have to cultivate that consciousness that that is how we must begin to look at the societies. And if we do that and begin to do that, I think we'd be on the way to dealing with some of the issues that we have because we can't, we can't just see criminals and statistics and problems without seeing humans. We have to see humans first. That is why I, um, I, you know, we, we can't live in fear. We can't. It doesn't make sense. You know, we have to see human beings. Thank you, Dr. Weeks. Uh, we continue with the discussion on the lecture and <laughs> what the twilight continues to say. I, I want to acknowledge the presence of Monsignor uh, Patrick Anthony, uh, as well as uh, Sir Derek's partner, Sigrid Nama. We haven't done that so far. Dr. Weeks, uh, how do you respond to, to the concern of the likely diminished legacy of the black race, the diminished opportunity, diminished priority? Should there be full embrace of this vision of Sir Derek of multiculturalism, this diplomacy? Because just as concerning as he, just as concerned as he was for colonialism, the corruption of colonial, colonialism, as well as the concern he had for post-colonial nationalism, uh, any, any response to the risk of us, um, of, of the black race being diminished or feeling diminished in that pursuit? 
Okay, so it's Nobel Laureate Week and we're celebrating Saafa as well as um, Derek. And um, they both came of age um, as, the, as the, the, the British Empire was in decline and we were beginning to come into our own. Um, but for both of them, and it's clear from Derek's writings and from Saafa's writings as well, that what concerned them was the poverty of the people, the poverty of the people, um, you know, and the, the degradation that this poverty caused. And, and so in two different ways, South as an, as an economist, through his research and his work um, and his articulation of routes that we could take to make use of, of, of the, the resources of our people um, for their own development, and Derek, through his poetic vision, um, capturing them in that, in that twilight and seeing where they could be, um, it is clear that both of these great men wanted the elevation of the people out of the indignity of, 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 of poverty, right? Um, and, and really um, debilitating living conditions. So, so when you ask about, so this is what diminishes, diminishes us. This is what is creating a lot of chaos and anxiety, you know, among our people in the communities and so on. So, so we seriously have to be able to look at our people and see the, the possibilities for them in the twilight, in, 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 in that gilded frame. We have to see them there. So many things from our colonial heritage um, allow us to see our people in the harshest of ways, you know, to speak of them in the harshest of, of, of um, terms, to see them as good for nothing, right? So much in our history has caused that. So, you know, so that's part of the wound. But part of the wound. When, when we travel and we go to all these developed places and so on, and we, we understand and we, and we do appreciate that these people have a sense of pride, not just in themselves, but of their people. So they don't look at their people as good for nothing. They look at their people as people who are entitled, who deserve good living conditions, right? So do we, do we see our people that way? Do we really do? Or are we still, do we, are we still, have, do we, are we still affected by the colonial gaze where we see them um, there? Right? <laughs> One more question for me. Um, if you could speak to how literature, Caribbean literature, has evolved um, since the, the writings of Sir Derek um, pushing multiculturalism because during his time the other Caribbean writers were writing through the lens through the, 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 the lenses of race and it was not necessarily popular at the time he was a man starting this in, in literature so in your work um, at the university um, in your work here in St. Lucia how are you seeing there being an emergence of um, multiculturalism in literature being promoted in literature showing up in literature Yeah, it was always there because, um, because of our heritage, because um, being colonized by various colonial powers, we just naturally inherited um, cultural and linguistic um, elements from various places. So, you know, so it, it's, it's there in us and it comes out naturally in our work. Um, we write in a language, we write in English, um, we write in English Creoles or French Creoles. Um, so that itself is an indication. It's always there. I mean, for, for a person like, um, like Derek, who was more clearly, like he said, divided to the vein, was more directly wounded and affected by um, the, the multiculturalism, then a lot of it comes out in his work. Um, you know, so, and I think you know, Caribbean societies, you know, Trinidad, where I, where I, where I work, um, you know, particularly in the music and the writings, the literature, 
I mean, it's, these are issues that are explored all the time. And just naturally, because people express themselves, they want to express who they are, and there's always a search, um, or rather a need to express one's identity, to make a statement of who we are. So in societies where you have various ethnicities, you'd find that kind of dialogue happening through literature, through music, where they express who they are. So um, I, I don't think that is, that is going to go away. It is useful, it is important, um, but it is also particularly important that, that all voices uh, contend and that there is a recognition of equality, of, 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 um, of, of equality in terms of abilities, potentials, rights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But more importantly, as I try to show in my discussion, discussion sorry, the, the psychical decolonization, it has to happen with individuals, but it has to happen within the collective as well, the society has to happen. I am not convinced. I am not convinced that we have achieved psychical, mental, psychological decolonization. I think that is, uh, you know, that goes to the root of our problem. Mm. Well, I'm not, I, I can't say that I know Derek like you or like any of the other bright people there. But the, the one thing I get is that Derek is, Derek seems to be, at least from your lecture, somebody who straddled the two sides of a fulcrum, somebody who perpetually existed in the intersections of Venn diagrams. So he was neither the bourgeoisie nor the Malawi, he was neither the black nor the white, neither the educated class nor the uneducated, neither the Europeanized person nor the Africanized one. My question is, do you think that that served um, as an advantage for him, or did it in some way cheat him of the ability to express whatever he felt with the amount of venom or acidity that he wanted to? Yeah, well, I, I think that he was just a really dedicated and passionate artist. Um, I mean, I'm looking at, at from the outside. I mean, his partner is here. <laughs> I shouldn't be speaking to the man like I knew him. I had no interest in the individual, by the way. But I was, there was nobody. There, were, there are few people, as I found, as interested in his work as I was when I, when I was studying him. Um, so, the, but the point is, um, I think that, that dedication to the, to the art, I mean, I, you know, the man was just really so focused on his, on his art. I mean, I remember the first time I, I, I saw him on the beach many, many years ago, he was painting... He had an easel and was painting, and I remember some of us around him, and he was like, you know, he, 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 he hardly wavered from what he was doing, you know, um, hardly, just, he just was so zeroed in. So to answer your question, um, all these issues, whether it was this or that or whatever or whatever, I think he, he was just fired to put it into artistic expression, whether it is as a writer or as a painter, and that worked for him. Yeah. Let me, let me just make my question a little bit clearer. What I'm saying is, I, if I were to use an example, um, he, I, his, his parents were both mulatto, which means that he had some allegiance to his blackness and some allegiance to his whiteness. And in him saying something, expressing his opinion on something, how he felt about something, I'm thinking he may not want to offend his white side if the thing may be unwhite or his black side. I'm saying, do you think that that factored at all in the way he expressed? Or would he have been, had he been maybe a black man like myself, would he have expressed it with more venom than he did as somebody who's mixed? That's what I'm asking. I don't know how much more venom you would want, but if you were Afa in Sia Dofe, God is a white man. The sky is his blue eyes. The rain is his spit on the people of Dofe. 
אין לו ממש מבין המיניות, לדעתי. It happens that um, Derek seemed to have been that kind of man, dream on Monkey Mountain, and um, you cannot tell what his dream on Monkey Mountain is saying. I was trying to figure out whatever his dream on Monkey Mountain is saying, where is, um, you were on a mountain where dreams were. <laughs> All right, no. Okay, All right, let me just help you quickly. So... Um, Dream on Monkey Mountain, actually Monkey Mountain was patterned, it appears, on La Soucier, where you see a mist, if you're in Babylon, right? Yeah? So, Monkey but, but Makak, the character, had a dream. He saw a white apparition that tell him, if he goes to Africa, he'll become a king. That was the dream. He used to dream of this white apparition, like a large abless, who tell him, go to Africa, he'll, be a, he'll be a king. So that was the dream on Monkey Mountain. Yeah? Oh. All right. Okay. So, well, what I was driving at, it, uh, as I said, I was directing to, I was directing the writers. It happened that um, if Derek did um, write of subjective content, such as grace, peace, love, well abilities, and so on, where do you think recent conditions would have been today? I leave that to the writers. All right, thanks. Yeah, he wrote all about that, yeah. Um, Pablo, I hope you understood what I was saying. Uh, what I, the point I was making was that the venom and all that, he put it into his art. So the voice of Arthur, you, Afa, in Dufe, you know how venomous he is? So the man was an artist, so he wouldn't stand up there. And, you know, he, he, he was working, and, and he left the work. So... I, I, not, I wish I could do that, you know. I, I would prefer to be an artist. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a reluctant academic. I always resist in academia. So, you know, but the dedication to the art, that's what he did. Whatever conflicts he felt, he put it into the art. Yeah. Everybody. Dr. Weeks, thanks for giving me a different look at Derek Walcott. Because the Derek Walcott I studied and read about and so many of his creative works and um, he actually invited me to come to a rehearsal one time of, of his steel, which didn't quite make it. Um, <clears throat> but I'm hearing a whole different side of Derek. And one of the things about St. Lucian people, <clears throat> or St. Lucians as a whole, is we really do appreciate our people, like Sir um, Arthur and, and Derek. I would like to hear a little more about Sir Arthur, though, because that maybe because I know a little about Derek. Um, <clears throat> but with Derek, one of the things I was actually looking at, um, uh, maybe that's a part of the American part of me, but um, in terms of females, it's nice to hear you say, uh, look at the females from the perspective that you were giving us in terms of the sexiness and everything else. But um, sometimes I need to step back and look at it from a more chauvinistic perspective of, of the, way, the way he was seeing people. But also, we have to realize that as solutions, we have this double consciousness. Maybe we might even have triple consciousness, or maybe even more than that now, because we have what our culture now is about, the British, the French, very much the American from what I see, Chinese. Well, now it's Taiwanese, I guess. But... Um, <clears throat> Just understanding, um, we talked about, somebody asked a question about multi multiculturalism. Just, just looking at all of that for us, aren't we really confused people and we really need to get to a point of understanding that so we can start siphoning and realizing what we want to become? And um, because I think with Derek, I think that was part of his, uh, the, 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 the fight, because we, we do fight with ourselves, I don't know about anybody else, because we do have that French thing based on how you grew up, and then you have the English thing, the British thing, you know, and then you go away different places and live different places, and you get some of that too. So how do we really reconcile all these parts of ourselves, you know, to, to, to understand somebody like Derek? Because Derek was teaching both. Since then, I've read some of his brother's works, Roddy's works, and I, I tend to think that maybe Roddy had more of a St. Lucian self or St. Lucian uh, persona than, than Derek did, but we're not going to get into that right now. 
but um, tell me how you think that we should go about understanding ourselves and as academics. How do you really think that we should look at all these aspects ourselves and become this whole person? Because I don't know about anybody else, but it's really difficult, especially when you come back into St. Lucian society, to, to figure out who we are as St. Lucians. So I don't know if you could... Mm. Well, I, I just say this again. Again, again um, one thing I discovered um, about playwriting, um, you know, and um, when I was doing undergrad, I did a whole year of Shakespeare, and after that, I said to myself, Shakespeare really is the greatest playwright. One thing I understood about play playwriting was that you have to give each character you create equality of voice and expression. Um, well, let's say particularly main characters, because you have minor characters, you can't do it for all of them. But if you have main characters, you have to create what we call in, liter in literature, create around the characters, right? Um, so I'm saying this to say that at the, at the heart of it already lies humanity. So, you know, an art provides a, a way. So. As conflicting as one may be, so if, if I'm a playwright, in as much as, for example, I, I have advocated for the cause of black people and the decolonization, psychical decolonization, but if I were to create a play and I have main characters and I have a white character and I have a black character, right, as Derek has done in some of his plays, like, say, an unpublished play like Franklin or plays like, um, you know, some of the other plays like the, uh, the Joker of Seville or some of the later plays, I have to, to give this white character and this black character an equal chance or else my play would be flawed because I have not created whole human beings. I have been prejudicial and as an artist, I can't, I have to resist that. So, um, so we, we're talking about two things, and it's the same conversation with, with Pablo, my good friend there. We, you know, it's, it's two, two we, we're talking about art, but we're also talking about humanity. And, and so as a human being, in as much as you may be affected by the injustice or by prejudice or whatever, when you sit down with your work, you have to give fullness to each aspect of it that you, particularly if you're, dealing, if you're trying to create human, you mean. You didn't need humanity. I don't know if I'm answering your question. So the point is that um, the, he was a playwright, he was a poet, he was an artist, and when he sit down doing his work, the craft itself demands that anyway. The craft demands a fullness of treatment. As a human being, we need to, be, we need to look at that. We need to look at, look at all aspects of ourselves, right? In order to be whole, so I understand in terms of playwriting. But um, I think part of the question was, uh, he, uh, he was trying to understand, as a black man, would Derek be a little more forceful in his writing as opposed to Derek being a mulatto person, right? Uh, so I'm saying now, in terms of us people, St. Lucian people, how, there must be a way, and maybe not the artists, and maybe somebody else here in the audience could answer that question, but really and truly, how do we see ourselves as equals everybody, and that's not our society, we know that, at, from the bottom and the top? How do we see ourselves? What, what, what attributes do we have as St. Lucians to really represent ourselves as St. Lucians? There's, there's, right now, it is very confusing. It is exceptionally confusing for me, and I really would like for somebody to help me understand that. Because you're, we were coming, when I, when I listen to people on the radio, and I listen to, there are a lot of things that we have as St. Lucians, and religion being one of the key, by the looks of things. I was listening to a program today, and it shook me out that way. Because we need to understand who we are. So how do we understand who we are in order to move forward? How do we understand ourselves to, to develop well, fully? Well, in, in, in Omeros, um, Ashil, the main character, journeys back to Africa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he has to, in order to fully, in order for the psychical decolonization to play, to take place, mm -hmm. and for him to gain full acceptance. Okay. In Dream on Monkey Mountain, Macaque, um, through the dream, not literally, 
but it happens nevertheless. June is back to Africa. Um, so, I, you know, I, I made an attempt, that's why I make an attempt to go to the text. And I was saying earlier when I was having a discussion with the Pullet that um, artists, you have to look at their work, huh? you know. Everybody's an individual and it's a work that really, because the work is the truth. The work is the truth and that's why we do it, that's why we do the art. So, I'm, I'm, so I'm showing you in this individuals who, in his character, in his plays, in his work, rather, that has made the journey back. Um, so to know ourselves, mm -hmm. that part of us that we're made to be ashamed of, our roots, our history associated with our color, we have to go, we have to go back and find the truth there and erase a lot of the, the, the lies and, and then come to a full acceptance and a sense of our worth. So are we doing this now? Are we, are we, I mean, I, I love the fact that you just said that, because, but I don't see, or actually no, maybe I should take that back. Because there is a, there's, a little, there's a little of that coming now, right? Because I, I do see a little, a little of that. Because just looking around, I can see, I see all the different hairstyles now and all the different, but, but at one point in, 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 in um, I mean, Derek's work in terms of people wanting to be white or people wanting to be of, of a different color because we think that that is our true selves or that's the better self or whatever, whatever that is. But um, I, don't see, I don't see us doing enough of that. I lived in a community, in the community of Moshi for um, about five or six years and I did some research there. And one thing that startled me when I go there, there are young people there because of a myth who believe that they are cursed yeah, and the story has come down that um, there was a, a, a white priest and he was on a horse and the people forced him to dance and because of that he cursed the land and the people. And, um, and, and so you have people still carrying that around them believing that they're cursed and, and the narrative is repeated. I mean, I'm sure a lot of work has been done to try to um, counter that, but it's so it's so ingrained. But that's just a, a, a you know one part of 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 what happened what has happened to us. So so the, the, so yes, a lot of issues that we have stem from that still stem from a lack a, a deep that deep wound that needs to be so it is about cured. education and knowledge and, and, and continuously re educating ourselves and re-educating it younger ones and whatever, because somehow I think that we really do need to get into that part of ourselves that we're not really... A lot of people here have done a lot of work to try to yeah. oh, eradicate what, um, what you're saying. Um, and, and um, you know, it's not easy and it can't stop, but it has to continue, but it is urgent. And I think that part of the urge, some of the urgency has to now look at some of the current issues of the power dynamics in our society. And, 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 and we can't join that. We have to see the danger and pull out from it and continue the work and focus on the, on the roots. Okay, our discussion time has expired. I would like to thank Dr. Travis Weeks. What the twilight keeps saying, following the gaze of Derek Walcott, I know many of you would have loved to get in queue to ask him a question on, on the record, but you have time to, to pick his brain after uh, we're, we're, we're done with this broadcast. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Weeks, for that insight and that new perspective for many on Sir Derek Walcott. Uh, we, at this time, would like to invite to the lectern the Executive Director of the Cultural Development Foundation, Mrs. Ramona Henry Wynn, to present a token to our guest speaker this evening. And I think there's something special in there. They just went to get an additional gift to put in there for you on the exceptional job that you have done uh, this evening. So once again, thank you very much, Dr. Weeks. Let's give a round of applause on the latest presenter 
of the Sir Derek Walcott Memorial Lecture. Good evening, everyone. Permit me to recognize the presence of His Excellency Governor General Errol Charles, um, Dean Paulette Louisi, Governor General Emeritus, the Diplomatic Corps. I didn't hear mention of our past director, Mr. Lyndon Arnold, who's also the chair of Invest in Lucia. And thank you all of you for being here. Would you agree with me that there's a friend of mine, I'm not seeing him here tonight, um, Stan Bishop. He uses this phrase, home have. And I really think tonight, from listening to Travis, home have. You know, we speak of excellence, as the theme says. And the last five years, we have featured St. Lucians to deliver the Derek Walcott Lecture. And for me, that is an indication of how proud we are of who we are as a people and of our, of our own. I think I heard somebody say, are we, are we proud of our people? Yes, we are. Because it's evident tonight that we have, again, for the fifth year, featured as inclusion to deliver the Derek Walcott Lecture. And I think he has done justice. And I think that is why some persons were expecting him to think for Derek and how Derek would think. I think, there, um, Travis, you did a really wonderful job. I think your lecture was very profound. It was very um, self-explanatory. I think that is why you didn't get that many questions. People ask you to think for Derek. But I think you did a wonderful job of capturing and your interpretations of, of Derek's work, I think, um, has enlightened all of us in this room tonight. And I think um, this is what the, the, the Cultural Development Foundation and its work aims to do, to nurture that creativity. And I was even prouder when I saw your dad coming through the elevator. And for me, it was passing on that mantle, passing on that baton. And it is only because he has done that for you that you are able to stand here before us and really present, you know. So I think he deserves a round of applause. On behalf of uh, our ministry, our minister, the Honorable Dr. Ernest Hillier, and our ministry, the Cultural Development Foundation, Board of Directors, Management and Staff, and the uh, Nobel Laureate Committee, I wish to express our sincere gratitude to all of our supporters, the Library Credit Union, as I heard earlier, um, all of you for being here tonight, some faces you see year on year, um, you come out and you really sit and take it in. Um, we encourage you to continue to, to, to you come and encourage other persons to join you as well. I think um, the lecture tonight or what we come and sit here and listen to, I think a lot of times we have to pay for it. It's free to us. So I think we should really you know, embrace the talent that we have in St. Lucia. And I'd like to say again on behalf of my agency, the Cultural Development Foundation, the ministry, and the Nobel Laureate Committee, more so the chair of the committee, I would like to express our gratitude to all of you for being here. And um, get home safely, and I wish you traveling mercies. Thank you. Thank you. So on behalf of the Nobel Laureate Festival Committee, St. Lucia, we ex express sorry, its sincerest appreciation to Dr. Travis Wicks for presenting the 2020 Foster Derek Walcott Memorial Lecture on the 23rd of January, 2024, which also happens to be my birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Yay! 
Happy Nobel Laureate Day, everyone. And it's definitely ending on a wonderful note. We'd like to thank each and every one of you for coming out this evening. We hope that you've been well fed with the words from Dr. Weeks and also the insight and the input from some of the persons who contributed this evening. Thank you so much. Uh, this is all we have. And now we invite you to some refreshments um, outside. Do enjoy the rest of your evening and the rest of the Nobel Laureate Festival activities. Pourquoi ma femme doit pas, pourquoi ma femme doit pas aller